We rolling? Yes. Okay. How did you choose the stuff that you played that was going to be on this DVD? You had two shows to film. You had got uh, 25 years of Killing Joke music. How did you choose the set list for a two-hour show? Um, it's a funny thing. With Killing Joke, um, every time we approach a different tour, we always feel like doing some different songs or dragging this song out or dragging that song out. So much material to... to um, I don't think we put a lot of thought in it, actually. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, I feel like doing that. I look at Julie, and he goes, don't want to do that. I mean, we did some numbers um, at the two gigs that I haven't played for, well, quite literally 25 years. Mm. Before we did uh, these concerts, we had about two warm up shows. But, like, everyone in the band got really sick. There's been this, like, horrible flu bug and. And then there was lots of broken bones. Um, and Ben, the new drummer, he got a bit overexcited and he's like ended up with lots of stitches in his leg. Uh huh. It, nothing to do with violence or anything. It was just like he started jumping on cars. And, and when the police came, we had to pay them off. And then he put his, he was so excited about joining Kinjo, he put his foot through this window and sits down, and there's blood squirting everywhere. And he can't even remember being stitched up, basically. Right. He went to a military hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we were really worried about whether he could play. Um, and I thought, actually, I will get on with our lot. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing about young Benny, he can play bass drum with his ambidextrous on his feet. Which is he, always good if you're a drummer. There you go. There's only so many people can play in the style that you know, a lot of these tom tom patterns and tribal patterns, they can play it. It's heavy going doing two hours of killing joke on drums. Mm. I mean, Dave Grohl was, he's, I've worked with pretty much, the, I think, the best drummers in the world mm. in killing joke. Mm. But this young lad kicks all their asses. I mean, he's half our age, mm. and he calls me Julian and Raven. Um, his other three dads. <laughs> <laughs> you're not doing a very good job of keeping her out of trouble then, if you're supposed to be Well, we had to have words because, like, you know, he didn't have much money left after we paid the police off and right. and all the, the doctor's bills and he started to realise this whole myth of rock and roll lifestyle, um, you have to pay for it. Right. You can smash up anything you want. It just comes off your wages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've been to some of the biggest rock star mansions in the world. I've flown on a private 747 from Auckland to Frankfurt. I've had a bath at 35,000 feet with a spliff, mm -hmm. right? In a private 747. I've seen wealth beyond. You know what? It doesn't impress me at all. My friends are the poorest, and Kinjo's Kinjo's friends are the poorest and richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. We don't like the ones in the between. They're boring. Mm. Huh? And the wonderful thing about living between Prague and New Zealand and several other countries is uh, every time I go home to New Zealand, I get to go home a different way. And I get to see all my friends either in South America. and The travel's good, mm. if you like traveling. Um, I'm sick of flying. And I used to love it and get really excited about flying, you know. And like, we've got Killing Joke fans based at Heathrow mm. that we always fly first class because they upgrade us always, right? <laughs> anyway, right? You know. But I, I mean, I've had fortune. The last two flights I've gone back first class to New Zealand via South America. I've just been vomiting up the whole flight and I'm all feeling sick as a pig. And like, um, so I don't eat anything. It's all a waste of money. Mm. It's very funny though, because like, um, the last time I went back, the Kin Joke fans, as you, they literally take you into first class. They see there's, there's a space there, then plonk you in the seat. Uh -huh. And I got so pissed up now, the time before last that this air stewardess said she bought these pajamas out for me. And she went, arms up, like this, like that. And I went like this, like that, like that. British Airways are like, they're like school prefects, but horrible female public school type. <laughs> you put your arms up like that. 
and they put my pajamas on, got my bed ready, and they basically pushed me in. <laughs> <laughs> I never eat on those planes. Economy class, first class, it's all the same to me. It's yeah. rubbish. I love the British people. The one thing about being an expat is it teaches you. You don't want to live in England, but it teaches you to love your people. What I love about the, the Brits is their sense of humour and their ability to laugh at themselves, mm -hmm. right? Kiwis haven't got this. They really, you have a look at New Zealand humour. It just isn't funny yeah. at all. And I, I end up, you know, even when we're in Prague, we've got our tribe, as it, as it were, you know. I mean, I live around the corner from Raven and Geordie. It's a lovely thing, 26, 27 years on, living around the corner from each other. All in Prague. We're all in Prague. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the year, because we're always travelling there, see? Mm. We go between Prague and Geneva mm. and New Zealand. Um, but it sounds all kind of exotic, and yes it is, um, but God, we work like crazy. People wouldn't, they like, they like the sort of superficial side of our life. They say, oh, you're going there, you're doing this and that. They wouldn't last 10 minutes. Mm. Uh, I like Prague for a number of reasons. Um, it's a very mystical place. The whole history of mankind is hidden and written in the masonry of Prague, of mystical Prague. Mm. And then I have the ability to go between the white heat of killing joke and then I'm in front in front of a great orchestra conducting them. Mm. And then I work with a lot of the folk music of um, of the Czech Republic. And uh, so like, I get a, I get a kind of, um, how can you say it? Like, well, let, let's put it like this. I don't believe there's a musician alive that has the diversity of experience that I do, mm -hmm. going from London Symphony Orchestra to uh, Czech Phil to I'm now working with Sydney Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. starting in um, October for one year. So I'll be commuting from Prague. Um, I'm with Czech National Orchestra there, and I'll be commuting from, from there with Killing Joke to Sydney, and I'll be going backwards and forwards this way. Mm. So I don't know anyone who's got a career quite as bizarre as mine and if they were there I'd like to meet them so I could pour my heart out to them <laughs> <laughs> what kind of memories have you got at this point in time about the start of, of the band how different was everything then because you were living together then but it wasn't it wasn't in Prague it was in London you know what you know what are your memories of, of, of back of, of that time um, very strange things happened I mean basically killing joke Started with two of us, myself and Big Paul. Mm. Now I was a keyboard player, you know, and I wasn't thinking about doing vocals and just keyboards. And Big Paul, of course, was a drummer. And so there we are in London, thinking we met by chance, very very quickly. But there was none thinking with Paul. How are we going to find our spiritual brothers? And they have to be great innovators with this to take what started with punk, but to another dimension. Mm. And we, the only way th we, we could sort of overcome this problem, we decided to um, basically do a prayer, or if you want to call it a ritual or ceremony. And we prepared uh, really for three months. And on the 26th of February, at three o'clock, myself and Big Paul did a ceremony of course, that's today. Yeah. It's coming up. Uh, yeah, in 45 uh, minutes time. In 45 it's the minutes anniversary. Um, and within two weeks of that ceremony, we had the other two. Right? Mm -hmm. It went that fast. I can't say Ken Jake's ever been ambitious because, I mean, let's be honest, the music is not exactly radio friendly. Mm. I mean, it is a little bit more these days because things have changed. But, but no one, no one but except John Peel uh, <laughs> yeah. was ever come near us, basically, you know. In fact, the only way we got our, our first hit mm. was by 
white labels, putting white labels on, so they didn't think it was Killing Joke because normally that went straight in the bin. <laughs> I'm serious. Really? I'm serious about it, yeah. I can remember this conversation um, coming up about we want, what we wanted to, to achieve. And one of the things was, well, we want to inspire a lot of other people. And Ferguson said, a renaissance. And when I think of all the, well, I mean, so many bands and artists that have, you know, um, taken our music and ran with it, as it were, mm. and some ripped us off directly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that the idea of valuing friendship uh, is dearer to us. It always has been. We've always been a very tight-knit family band. Mm. You know, I mean, really tight-knit. No one could ever write a book on us because they could never get inside. Mm. I mean, we're the only ones who could really write a book on us. Um, so, like, um, I feel rich. I feel really, really wealthy. I feel more wealthy than the Beatles, the surviving members, and, like, Led Zeppelin and the Stones put together. Mm. Because I live round the corner from my mates who are in my band. And that's incredible. That is absolutely incredible, you know? What it is to work with these um, musicians, you've got this kind of psychic thing that develops over the years. Yeah. You wouldn't want anyone new, except our new drummer, he's the exception. Uh -huh. Benny is really, really gifted. You know, I mean, really gifted. I don't know any drummer that was that good at the age of 22. Mm. I mean, from great drummers like Dave and innovators like Paul Ferguson and Martin Atkins and um, all great players, but Benny's something special, mm. you know. Oh, his mum and dad were there. And they were very, very emotional about the concert, apparently. Uh -huh. And that's nice, well, that's isn't it? Good. You know? And um, when I see everybody happy, laughing, and when I see all my band on our days off, and we work six days a week and we have a Sunday off, mm. having Sunday roast together and hanging out together in our, our we've got our own bar, mm. but no one knows where it is. Right, um, secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love my country when I'm looking at across a blue Pacific, and I'm having marmalade on toast, right? Um, grapefruit marmalade, and a nice pot of tea on my veranda, right, with the jungle behind me, no tsunamis yet, and a white beach in front of me, and, and listening to the BBC World Service, right? Uh -huh. Or in Prague, again, I love that, but I don't like living in England, and neither any of the band, mm. but, we love our people, and and of course London is very special when we come back and play. Um, it's the only gig that makes me actually think, because they're really critical and they know when it's right and when it's really happening. And uh, you still get you still get nervous, particularly building up to to, to what no, we're talking about not today. Not at all. Even when you're filming for a DVD, no, you know it's going to be. I don't care about. It. Piece in of fact, a great history. gig for me is when I walk on stage and I walk off, and I can't remember an awful lot in between. What really scares me is um, when you've never conducted before. Mm. You've had three hours rehearsal, and you're going to conduct for your very first time in front of a president of a foreign nation, mm. and you took on the job and you'd never conducted, you just bullshitted your way into it, basically, yeah, yeah. you know? You said, yeah, I'll do that, and you've gone, oh, Jazz, what did you just agree to? <laughs> now you've got to go and do it. That was sincerely terrifying. I had three hours rehearsal, I'd never conducted an orchestra before, this is how I became a conductor. Uh -huh. I mean, I didn't go to music college, or I haven't got an O-level or CSC to my name. Mm. And uh, I basically, but I, I can read music really well, I can score for full orchestra. I studied under great masters, I mean, living leg classical legends. Mm. I went and studied under them, I had private tuition. But really, I'm a sort of self-made creature. And it was quite amazing, because I was so terrified 
um, about going out on stage, my first time conducting for orchestra, that I sent, I sent my wife out, I sent everybody out of the conductor's apartment, and I was absolutely shitting it. I didn't know how to relax. The difference between um, an orchestra and a rock band mm. is that, like, um, when you conduct a downbeat with an orchestra, uh, this is what you think it is like. You think it goes like, bum, like that. It doesn't, it goes like this. Bum, they're behind the beat. Uh huh. It's not like a rock band. So you're basically, you've got this beast that's behind the beat and you're ahead of them, listening to it perfectly in your mind. There are some orchestras that can think like a rock band. You have to practice those damn beats. You go on the click on the stick and I practice those damn beats. I practice getting an orchestra to think like a band. Mm. Some orchestras that can do it, like London Symphony Orchestra can do it, because so many young players, a lot of them into rock music. Mm. Berlin Philharmonic, who I haven't worked with, could not do that. Mm. They could play it, but they couldn't feel it, mm. you know? I mean, I've had crazy times with orchestras. They're weird bunches as well. I mean, when I recorded with, like, London Philharmonic, um, Universal, who I was with at that time, um, walked into like the toilets at um, Air Linda's studio, and there was there was two of the orchestra shagging in the bogs. <laughs> they are really weird, incestuous bunches of people. Orchestras. So it's they can be more rock and roll than rock and roll. More people than you sometimes. think. A whole lot more than you think. I mean, look at Lenny Bernstein. You know, people know him from West Side Story. Mm -hmm. When he works with like Berlin Phil, he used to have a little guy. He's throwing five joints. He used to smoke them there and stink the place out. And the Berlin Phil wouldn't say a thing about it because it was Lenny Bernstein. Uh -huh. There's been some great people before us that have chilled out a bit with music. As, um, I think he's probably the only one that I can think of that comes to mind that, that liked the idea of groove and uh, at the same time was very comfortable about conducting symphonies or religious music. Mm -hmm. I write a lot of religious music or spiritual music and which you wouldn't think I would do, looking at me, I guess, um, the pictures that I've seen. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Maybe but, when you've got the priest's gown on, we might think that you might well, be getting no, a bit spiritual then. I have a parish, I am a lay minister, that is a scary thing. I've got St John's, um, and uh, but I'm not um, a normal Christian, I uh, which is to say... You um, would be. I have grave doubts that uh, a ghost impregnated the Virgin Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and I have grave doubts about like um, the literal meaning of the resurrection. So um, I can't really be like Christian in the sort of Pauline sense of the word. I am a Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic, experienced. I never like to evangelise on these things, mm. but whatever you experience that is your truth, mm. I'm right with you. You know, like, um, it's such a short life, yet, I have to be honest, I can never remember being dead, can you? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my point. That's why I'm a believer. I always have dreadful memories of, of recording, um, Killing Joke 2003, mm. dreadful memories of great people like Geordie begging for their fucking bus fares. Hey, yeah, disgusting. Mm. This business, don't get me fucking going. Feel that? Hey, that's how angry I feel about it. Just shit, the suffering and pain that the rip-offs in this business and what they've done to my people, mm. see? Um, I can never let this happen again. we got, we got powerful people around us now, uh, not that scum that we had before, but absolutely awful. No, um, I have terrible memories. Because we... The only thing you could do doing that album is fucking drink heavily because it was so fucking depressing, right? Not the people, but the people we were working with, as it were, mm. you know, past tense. Mm. You know, music, 
I love it, that album too. Although I think it's a demo compared to what we're doing for the new one. Mm -hmm. Right? And if I didn't think I could better that last one, I wouldn't bother and wasting your time or mine. Mm. Right? Shiver down the back or Uzi does it. Right? I destroy what's anything that's not brilliant. We just destroy it. Mm. There's standards to be kept, and uh, I think Killing Joke is one of those very, very special bands um, for special, special people. In one band, you yeah, have composers and architects, so many different talents. I mean, Raven is probably one of the funniest men I know on the planet, but you'll never get him on camera when he comes out. I mean, he's the only guy I know where you've, we, we've literally had to start a fight with him because we're cracking up so much. <laughs> I mean, dying of laughter. He's one of the funniest men I know. But but um, never never in front of people like him. Um, very, very, very witty, incredible person. Um, you know, I'm really blessed with the guys. Jordy and myself, we're, we're sort of... It's a special relationship, definitely, mm. you know. He, he knows me and I know him in terms of, I know what to get out of him and how he works, he knows how I work. Mm. We've been together for a long time in that way. And I what? guess that the band has outlived all our marriages. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 is, what is the work process like for Killing Joke? Because there's the three of you all living around the corner from one another in Prague. Do you write all the time or do you decide when it's time to make a new Killing Joke album and start writing together then? How, how, how does it work? There's, a, there's a, a day that you start and um, eventually it's finished. I'm used to... Um, work on very tight schedules and Kinja does work horribly enough well under pressure mm. let me put it like this I, I wouldn't like to take Killing Joke to like a paradise island and record in one of those beautiful studios like Compass Point or yeah, the Bahamas and stuff like that it wouldn't just wouldn't have the edge mm. to it I mean for this new record we're going to all the poverty stricken war zones of the world so we, so what I'm going to do is like force everybody to face what's happening. Each member of the band has to basically choose or appoint one of three successors upon their death. And of course these people, they won't literally own or inherit everything we've got. They'll be able to use the facilities. So you can see this band that's becoming a tradition mm -hmm. that will outlive us <laughs> right and we'll go on annoying people uh, for the next like you know like 40 decades god willing uh -huh. huh we have some really different ideas so there. you're just going to push it on down the line Absolutely. so when, when you're It'll gone never stop they'll never get rid of us you know something else right you know that that awful magazine enemy mm. When they find they they reduced now to this horrible kind of teen, teen pop magazine. I'm gonna throw a big party when they go down. Uh, eventually they'll flush, mm. right? Hey, they'll flush down the bog. We always hate that, that magazine, that rubbish. And it's so nice to see them, just the crap that they really are. Yeah, and. Um, yeah. So anyway, we'll be throwing a big party, whether I'm in this world or not, when they go down. But eventually, enemy will flush down the bog. Uh-huh. We have gone through some pretty terrible things and come out and survived them, you know. And I think we've always done the right thing. But I still feel a terrible anger, as you can see, mm. um, about certain things. And can, when people harm my people, People I love, Geordie and Raven, and all the Matt and just the whole gathering, which is basically the army of people that have just kept us going through the years. Mm. Um, they're the best, you know? Again, friendship, a full stomach, and somewhere to put your head down. You got it, mate. You got mate. it sorted. I'll be honest, I, 
I, I think about dying and I think about suicide and I, a lot, but I just don't think I've finished my job yet. You know, I really admire that spirit in the Japanese, the ability to die at will, mm. you know. You know, I, I kind of, um, what I dislike about my own culture, Western culture or British culture, if you like, is their um, inability to die properly, you know, like like Eastern people when mm. they die, okay, kamikaze or suicide bombers, call them what you like, but to die with dignity and, and like to, uh, no fear, I, you know, if we could get a little bit more of that into our own culture, you know, a uh, people with no fear, uh, that's the best thing we can give our children. All this nonsense, hellfire and damnation. God is not so cruel. But definitely there is. Um, there is order and form and reason to existence. Mm. Some days I really do wonder, you know, I mean, I, I wonder aloud and openly about like the death of Dr. David Kelly, for example. When the medics got there, there, there should be blood squirting seven foot around and they're all it's full of spooks. Mm. And we all know that who's done in. What I wonder about is how far up the chain? Who knew about it? I mean, you think? Do you think? Do you think Alistair Campbell knew about it? Tell me what you think. I think, yeah. Really? And um, do you think um, Diana was assassinated? Mm. Yeah. Do you think the royal family would have known about that assassination? I would have thought certain people. Do you there think the done. British people feel that she was assassinated? Mm. See, it won't flush, will it? No. Yeah, I I too feel these things, and I feel that I feel so sorry for people like Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, because they're going to have to face their deaths, knowing they could have saved over a hundred thousand lives. <laughs> That's Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the room is <laughs> What What's your reaction to, to some people's um, opinion of Jazz Coleman that you're a little bit unhinged and you're a bit of a madman and, and, and so on and so forth because you obviously firmly believe that you've got some very poignant things to say and I think sometimes people write you off as, as some sort of freak, maybe. Yeah, that's why they'll kill you and not me because I'm a nut. Yeah, I think that um, there's an element of truth in that. Well, I'm not so stupid. Mm. Uh, but I do think there's an element of truth in that, yeah. Mm. Do you think sometimes may you can know too much or maybe be dangerously intelligent to certain people in certain areas of, of government? And oh, like no, I, I, I'm talking about like uh, just basically my anger mm. and my ability to um, just completely explode and... Uh, violence and blood dripping off the walls and I mean we have a clean up team mm. in Killing Joke and I'm serious about that because you know what sometimes when certain members of the band they just uh, they've gone too far the only thing you do is smash a bottle over their head and sometimes you end up like doing something else and it all goes a bit mad but we always end up Having a cup of tea the next morning, everyone's civilised, right? Even yeah. though it looks like there's been a murder. <laughs> in the room. Oh, yeah, there's oh, several yeah. occasions in the last two years. Yeah. There's but, th but, you know, these guys are my best friends. I don't believe there's a band alive that can say, um, well, after 26, 27 years, mm. you know, these guys are my best friends and we live around the corner from each other and I don't... Show me a band. I don't. I can't see them. No. They hate each other. Yeah. You know, it's just a job to them. Yeah. It's a love and a lifestyle to us. Have there been any times 
during Killing Joke's career when it did look like it like it was ending for for whatever reason maybe outside forces or you know you said you've had ups and downs was there a time when you thought truth or the official it? version we're doing the DVD <laughs> we, we might as well get the truth <laughs> I don't know whether you want to hear the truth though the I, think, I don't think you could take it I don't think you could take it if I told you the truth mm. I think you'd be horrified do we not want to do the truth on, on this DVD then? That's a very interesting point, isn't it? Okay, so why isn't Big Paul with us? Ask me. Why isn't Big Paul with you? Because he karate punched my girlfriend and split her nose in half and wouldn't pay for the plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, Paul. <laughs> do you like that one? Mm. Do you want to hear some more? If you want to tell them. <laughs> and so that's what I mean about it. does the truth make anybody any happier see we're not going to use that on the DVD because mm. it would just upset people mm. and that's what we don't want in our family right it's a terrible thing to admit and say I suppose but for me um, seeing Julie have his own place for the first time in 10 years where he's master of his domain. It was particularly moving. You know, when Geordie goes into the next world, there's no one, no one can replace him. Everybody from Jimmy Page, everybody in the world knows this. And yet the man, when we did that 2002, was begging for bus fares. Mm. I'll never forgive that. I can never forgive that. I try all I can, I try my hardest when I feel that terrible surge of anger that I really do want to harm somebody mm. and put that into motion. That's when you have to fight the greatest enemy, which is yourself. Yourself, you know? And I do have a terrible temper, a terrible fear of my temper. Mm. and. Um, and what people have done to my band, right? You'll learn this year, not on DVD, but you will learn. You will learn. Um, I I can't believe what we went through on that 2003 album. Mm. We have a charity that was starting with Killing Joke called A Forest in a Day. It's my father's idea. Um, before he died, he told me, he said, son, you can plant a forest in a day. Think what you can do in a week, never mind a year. Mm. And I will never rest until I carry out my father's wishes. Plant a forest, yes, a whole forest in one day. It's it's my dad's dream. Mm -hmm. it's, and Gillen Joke is part of this, mm. this dream, you know? We have designed a temple, and we're going to build that temple. Mm. We have articles that must be carried out. There's enough to go around. There is no I own a mansion. There is no I own property. No one owns anything, and that is the truth. It's not some communist shit. It's a short life, and you're just a caretaker. And what it's like? living a shit life, doing things you hate, just to get enough money to um, own something. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense to us in Killing Joke. Our value system is just radically different from any other band. I want, I want to move so many bands to basically not owning anything and put all the resources together and not just between our tribe within Killing Joke but bands between bands listen we need clean water we need biospheres we need like um, ecosystems that are gonna fuel uh, and provide for our people 
it's not going to be processed foods you can buy in supermarket everywhere. It's going to fall to bits sooner or later. The pennies don't add up. You see, like, you can't just keep printing printing money. I mean, look what's happening to the American dollar. It's so beautiful. Mm. Such a beautiful thing. Hey. I really do sincerely believe that the world would have been better if we, if Great Britain had, had England had conquered America properly. It's um, four lines by an unknown author that are very sacred to me and Geordie that says our entire value system. Cattle die, kindred die, but I know one thing that never dies, the glory of the great dead. Oof. <laughs> 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 <laughs>